No waiting on. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> but um, I, I would be surprised if that hadn't happened this year. Yeah. You know, they just yeah. got stranded and they just couldn't, you know, couldn't yeah. do anything. And I would think skiers pushing them off the hill mm -hmm. would be a good thing to get them off those mm -hmm. top. So it's, it's my here. pleasure to introduce Sierra. <laughs> um, Sierra Robotsik <laughs> has been the regional though, wildlife population biologist <laughs> yeah. for the Magic yeah. Valley region yeah. of the Idaho but Department of Fish and Game I don't know. It's, since it's 2018. An interesting there's she received a Bachelor's like of Science in Wildlife Resources Sam's from the University of Idaho ranges, in 2013 so like and like a Master's degree from the University of Idaho. Yeah. Her research there focused on modeling pregnancy yeah. rates of elk in yeah. Idaho yeah. and their habitat use. She began working for Idaho mm -hmm. Fish and Game as a wildlife technician mm -hmm. in the Upper Snake region, which yeah. is around Idaho Falls, in 2014. And prior to her graduate work, she worked on a variety of wildlife projects in Colorado, okay. Idaho, Wyoming, and New York. So please join me in welcoming Sierra. <laughs> All right, thank you, Kristen and the library for having me back, nice you. and thank you thank all for coming. Um, it's great to be able to get, oh, come up here and talk like, about I've wildlife your name. for an hour yes, or so, and I'll here. be here for a while after, uh -huh. so if anyone has questions about anything that I don't cover in uh -huh. this talk, just grab yeah. me. Um, I can talk about this stuff okay. all day. So, okay. um, well, so today nice I'm going to focus you. on wintering yeah. wildlife okay. in the Wood River Valley. Um, I'm guessing that most of you are year-round residents or spend a great amount of your time here in the winter time. Um, so what we're going to go through today is what species spend their winter here down in the valley, um, how they survive this very cold, snowy time of the year, what we can do or not do to help them out, and the bigger picture, trying to, when you leave here, my goal is that on a more regular basis, if you don't already, you, you consider wildlife in your, in your daily goings on. So anytime you're out and about and you see wildlife, just, you know, try to take something away from what we talk about today um, as to how you can behave when you're in their habitat or how you can make your area around your house safer for you and safe for wildlife. So we're going to do a little bit of a, of a two-part talk. The first is going to focus on what you can do around your houses, and then the second is about what you can do when you're out recreating. So all of these species are probably very familiar to, to you guys. So we've got pronghorn, mule deer, elk, and moose. Those, I'm gonna focus on the ungulates, so our hooved animals that spend the winter in the valley. Um, we will talk a little bit about the predators as well, so particularly mountain lions, but I'm mostly gonna focus on the ungulates. As Kristen mentioned, I've done a lot of work with, with elk in particular, but it's kind of more of my specialty is, is the ungulates. So these pictures here, uh, there's a similarity among most of them, and that's that these animals are laying down they're resting um, in the winter time. And I'm gonna an keep bringing that up, that wildlife, that is the single most important thing that they can do in the winter to survive, is to rest. Um, and that's gonna be a common theme throughout today. So um, the pronghorn up in the top right corner, sorry, top left, um, they can survive temperatures so down today, to negative 50 um, degrees. Sierra They've got Robotsic hollow, hollow back. hairs, um, um, all of them do, wildlife. but pronghorn in particular, their, their fur is, is really unique, um, very hollow. Lions, um, um, and so as long as they're not expending a ton of energy and they're able to keep their fat reserves on them, they can withstand very cold temperatures. Um, similar for all the other species. Deer and elk, they don't start using energy until it's about negative 30 to negative 40 degrees. So again, very hardy. And the moose, we all know where they live. They, they are a very northern species. They go clear up to Alaska. Um, so they can get down to, to negative 50 as well before they even really start using energy to stay warm. And that's all because of their coats, hollow, hollow fur. And it's also because they spend most of their summer and fall putting on a lot of fat. Patricia Lurk from Sun so this is kind of the Arts. annual uh, life cycle of all of these species. The so we'll start it's in the winter because that's where um, we're at right now. And I also uh, am going to focus a lot so we on know the female, how many people are coming um, in if she the needs female to cohort of all of like these that. animals. So um, also for elk on that same and moose, night in that's this cows. Room. Um, for Tony uh, pronghorn and mule deer, those Evans are does. Is going to be and the reason I'm going to focus on them is because if you think about what they're it's going also through right free, now, but um, they are all, most of them are going to be pregnant. So they got bred in the fall. So they are pregnant right now. And some of them might even still be nursing a calf. I've seen 
you know, and then we are also just launching a kindergarten so readiness still actually program, be um, which helps parents learn how to while teach their while kids to learn. And trying to get um, through so this pretty, that, pretty difficult time of year. Main library. So then, as we move into spring, you can so see it's this my health. pleasure to introduce skinny. Sierra. She just made it um, through the whole Sierra winter. Has been the she burned through a lot of fat reserves, and now she's the Magic giving birth to another calf. And she's got to get that calf all the way through the summer. 2018. Lactating is a she very, very energetically demanding in time of uh, the year for, for elk and deer, all of them, all of the female and animals. They're going to expend a ton of energy, and they're going to be trying to gain back everything they lost last winter. So as we move into fall, you know, they're, they're probably use. doing pretty good if the habitat is good. They were able to eat a lot and pack on the pounds. In the upper now a lot of our, region, our animals migrate, though, so they undergo these long, and prior um, to her graduate work, twice she a year, worked on a spring and fall migrations. In Colorado, so they're going to move down out Idaho, of the high country Wyoming, and, and down into lower elevation so please winter range. Join me so around here, as I was talking to some of you about beforehand, there's a lot of animals that just live here year-round now. They're all right. Really Thank migratory. you, Kristen, and the library so for having me back. All of these species, and thank you all um, for coming. You might notice um, there's more of them in the valley in the winter. Come up here and talk about wildlife and some for of an hour or so, and I'll be down for a while after. So if anyone has questions about range. anything that I don't cover our, in this talk, some of our deer and our prong grab we're putting um, collars on. We've been putting collars on for a while, for a few years now. So today I'm going to focus on wintering wildlife in the Wood River Valley. I don't know if you guys have. I'm guessing that most of you are year-round residents or spend a great amount of your time here in the winter time. Summer. So what we're going to go through today is what species spend their winter here down in the valley. Pretty. How they survive this very cold, snowy time of the year. They maybe did that. What we can do or not do to help them out. That some of the development of the valley has short stopped. Trying to when you leave here, my goal is that on a more regular basis, if you don't already really hard winters, consider wildlife. In your, in your Those daily goings on. Moved so, anytime you're out and about and you see wildlife, down just, onto the desert. you know, try to um, take something some away from this what we talked about today. If they, if they um, didn't make it out how in time, you can and the snow got really crusty when you you're in their habitat, or how you, how you can make your area around your house safer for you and safer for wildlife. So, we're going to do a little um, bit of it's, it's of a pretty two part talk. To watch the that first is going to focus on what navigating you can do around houses, and then the um, second is about what you can do when you're out recreating. So then, from spring into summer, I just talked about fall. They migrate, and then we so move into all of winter. these species are probably very familiar now, to, really to you guys. So we've got winter. pronghorn, mule deer, uh, elk, and using moose. All of their fat Those I'm going to focus on the ungulates to make it so our hooved animals that spend a lot in the valley. We will talk a little bit about predators as well in the winter time, particularly mountain lions. So regardless of what's on the landscape. Even if you see as Kristen eating, mentioned, I've done a lot of work with, with their elk in it. particular, but um, and that's kind really of just more of my time of year again, resting is, is the ungulates. single best thing they can do. So because that allows these them to pictures not here, those fat uh, there's so a similarity quickly. among most of them. And Another that's thing that these I'll mention is that all of the down. species we've talked about so far are ruminants. In the winter time. So there's a few more things that go along with that. Keep bringing that up. That ruminants wildlife can only that eat is so the single most they important have to thing stop that they can do to, in the winter to digest. To survive. They, they have to chew their rest. Head. They've got the four um, And that's going to be a common theme I'm throughout with today. That so, at a certain um, level. The pronghorn, um, and so up in they the top really right corner, are limited sorry, in their left. amount of time that they um, can even They can spend survive eating. temperatures so down to negative 50 degrees. All of these things kind of they've combined got together hollow, to why hollow it hairs. Again, is so um, important all that they of them don't do. Burn through those but pronghorn in particular, their their fur is is really unique, um, very hollow. So I was trying to think of ways, um, and so you know, as long as they're I not expending like a ton of energy and they're able to keep their fat reserves on them, they can withstand very cold temperatures. Similar for all the other species. What does that mean? They don't start using energy until it's Maybe not perfect 30 to negative comparison, 40 degrees. but so again, on the very left hardy. hand side, and this is for adults. We all know where they live. Woman. They they and are a very the northern fat species. Would be they go for clear up to Alaska. To um, to, to so be they healthy can get down to, and to, to negative 50 um, as well before they you know, even be really able to start using properly. energy to so stay warm. So for us, at a and that's all because of their coat, 20 hollow, to 39 hollow year old woman, it's 21 And it's also because they okay. spend most of Which their is, summer and you know, fall that's putting on a lot of you fat. Compare it to the right hand side here for So this an adult is kind of the annual life cycle of so all of these at, species. So at we'll their start in winter, that's where we're at right now. And they can get up into the 20% And I also am going to focus a lot on the female. 16 to 20 female per really healthy of all of these animals. At their highest. For elk and they're moose, less that's cows. For so uh, imagine pronghorn and mule deer, those are does. Got, and the reason I'm going to focus on have. them is because if you think about what they're winter, going through right now, 
the temperatures um, they in are all have. most of them are um, going to be pregnant so they got bred into losing fall. weight so <laughs> they are pregnant right months. now and some or of them maybe might even more. still Five be nursing in calves I've um, seen depending on how early you know it calves snows. nursing clear so into January this was so pretty they interesting still actually I never really thought of it in this way um calf how they compare to us and what they're able to get through this cow can still be difficult time of year our essential so body then, fat as, as we a move human in the spring, is 10 to 13 percent. This elk, she's pretty that's, skinny. That's like she what just we made it through the whole to be able to like winter. mentally and physically. She burned through a lot function. of her fat reserves. Now and now she's men, all giving of birth to lower. another calf, <laughs> but and she's got to um, get that calf all the way through the summer. It's a good comparison. Lactating is a very very uh, energetically demanding really put yourself time in of uh, the year for for elk and deer, all of them, all of the female animals. They're going to expend a ton of energy, and they're going to be so trying to gain back everything they lost. So as I was this presentation together, I was trying to find winter. old photos to so show the change. So as we move into fall, um, you know, they're, I have they're not probably been here. doing pretty I've good. The habitat is good. So we were able to eat um, a lot and pack on the towns. You know, some of you have been now here. Now a lot of I've our, talked to our you animals migrate, though, so, so they undergo these longer. Long, so um, you might be multi generation in your spring and fall. Grandfathers were here, so they're going to move down out of the high country. You know, this was kind of interesting because here we've got it's the same view basically talking to some of you about this beforehand. This is Delaview Mountain There's a lot of here. animals that can just correct me if that's wrong. I think it's Delaview. They're not really migratory. Um, but this a lot of our populations on the left of all of these species, and then here um, it was you might notice there's more of them in the valley in the winter than um, there are in the so summer. So you can see how and animals that may have navigated the landscape down the drainages differently back from high elevation summer range to winter range. You some know, of our we, um, deer and are our very fortunate to live in an area where we're putting so collars on to outdoor recreation now. Wild um, places. Some of you and, may have seen the pronghorn up at Phantom and Hill. And all that, but uh, in reality, I don't know if you guys the valley have itself seen that little group is pretty that's densely there. populated. We finally got some collars so Idaho on Falls, them. which is the fourth um, the largest city in Idaho, has 14, last summer, 1500 housing units per square mile. That's and for a large city. That's pretty. Ketchum has your typical pronghorn winter range in Triumph. Still less dense. They maybe did that. It's a pretty darn dense area. A hundred years ago, they're moving through every day. That some of the development in the valley has short stopped. You know, it's probably changed their migration. As we already talked about, some animals are actually living in town now. And sometimes they do in really, really hard winters. You know, 2017, those pronghorn moved farther south and crossed Highway 20 and continued down onto the desert. I tried to. I pulled these just this morning. For some reason, done a nicer job, but I tried to outline some. They didn't make it out in time. Snow landmark really for you on each. And they're just gonna the one on the down left is mule deer winter range, winter. and the one on the right is elk winter the time range. These are modeled. Has kind of these are modeled by, based so on hopefully they make habitat, it. basically. Um, but um, it's, as to it's what pretty is interesting uh, to watch that color data and how they're winter winter navigating in our river valley. So um, red is, is very high quality. So then, high from spring into summer, I just talked about fall. They migrate and move out from that red to cooler temperatures. Now animals don't really put on any weight in the winter. Uh, so you can see in a lot of places, of fat so we've got that they put on here to make it through. And then um, the East Fork a lot, is up as here. You, can imagine, you might notice a lot of the south the nutritional value or in red. the wintertime. So you regardless of what's that on is, the landscape, the snow burns off even if you there, see them eating, warmer, they're probably not just putting any fat than on their facing slope. So a lot of our um, animals and that's are really just at really this time of year again, resting is the single best thing they can do that burn off because that allows them, them to not burn them through those fat winter on. so quickly. Um, but the valley has a lot of it, especially for Another thing I'll mention is that all deer don't weather the winter quite as well as the elk do. So there's a few more things that the shorter legs. It's harder for them to move. Ruminants can only eat so much before they have to stop eating to winter weather, to digest because they. So they a lot of them are more They've migratory, the but the elk can stay up familiar in some of these areas at a certain camp. level. And a lot of that is in the valley. Um, and so they and really of it are limited in the amount of time that they like can go spend recreate on. So, and so all that, of these things talk kind of combine together as to why, but again, just something so to keep in mind, they don't burn this through is those their reserves too quickly. needed winter range um, to make it through. So I was trying to think of ways, you know, when so I we're say talk a little like bit about what you can do now that we've need set the groundwork. Body fat. I'll give you a second to, to if you can read that. Rate, high chance of survival. Um, there's what some does home that improvements mean? you can do. And um, you can think so of it kind of like child proofing. Maybe not perfect comparison. So you comparison, can't tell the deer and elk. But on the left hand side of my house, this is for the window adult, well. That's a healthy adult female woman. You might need to do something and about it body to keep fat them would be from for her putting themselves to get and you in that position. To, to be healthy and to, um, so the first you know, one is be cover your window well. Um, so for us, so at a healthy this, weight, these are both from a 20 to 39 year old woman. It's 21 to 33. I was not here for moose. That was before I started. That's pretty interesting when you compare it to the right hand side here. For an adult cow elk. <laughs> when we're done, I believe so he was there. 
at their um, highest. But you know, this is dangerous for everybody, and it's really unfortunate. But typically, we, um, it's it's sixteen in to both of these cases really we had to come up. I believe in dart at their both highest of them, which requires drugs, they're less which than is what we are. For us, it's dangerous. So for imagine them. trying to and, take what uh, you've already got, move them, what most and of it's us just, probably it's, have. It's not always make the it silver bullet that it is. We've lost animals. The temperatures and the snow that we have. Um, and they can be in here for a not, while before just we know they're there, and, then <laughs> and you really have to make it for three hot. months. So, or maybe anyway, more, the best thing you can do if you think um, about your house, you know, and as the snow comes off so the roof, this was pretty interesting. Right right I'd never really thought of it in this way. Um, how they so compare animals to us and what they're able that, to do. I mean, no a cow can still get pregnant at nine percent. And in the case of moose, you might clear through the window and end up in the basement. Thirteen percent. So that's that's like what we just like braiding or putting plywood, anything you can do to cover. Now, cover your window men, wells all of these in the winter time. <laughs> that but, can be very, very um, helpful to wildlife. It's a good comparison to uh, remove entanglement really hazards. This one's hard because it's amazing what can end up being an entanglement hazard that you never would have thought of. Um, we've had so at as least I was putting this presentation together, I was trying to find old photos to show the change. Them, and um, as you can see, they can I have not been them here. I've only been here five years. In the way, so, and so we went up and darted that. Calf you know, some to get of you have been here. Off of I've talked head. to a few of you who've been um, here 50 we've years. We've had the maybe even um, longer. The like so air might chairs, multi generation, exactly and your, them, and your hang grandfather's like here. And so, chairs. you know, this was um, kind of interesting this is because just here we've got one, it's the like same three weeks view, ago, this basically, bowl, and had an I entire tennis This is Delaview Mountain here. So you can correct me if that's wrong. I think it's been dragging that for we don't know how long. This was very tired on the left hand side, and then here it was in 2018. Anything you can imagine, tomato cages. So you can see how animals may have navigated the landscape differently back then than they do now. Christmas lights, and, um, you know, we, if people we are very call, fortunate we tend to, to tell them if you, where we're so please hang your Christmas lights above six foot and off the ground. Wild places wrapping them around and, and the tree all the way up is very pretty. That. But in um, reality, but the valley itself bull elk in particular is pretty densely and populated. Sometimes deer will run so the Idaho Falls, which the tree, is the fourth largest city in Idaho, up. has fourteen um, and sometimes it's okay. Sometimes they'll shed their antlers and lose the that's the lights in a large city. But a lot of times, Ketchum has twelve neck. It so can keep them from eating. Still less dense, um, and but then it's just another it's one of those situations we can try and go and, and move them through it every day. It, we might not um, be able to. And, and in you know, that it's case, probably changed some behavior from those things. As we were we talking about, some animals are actually least. living in town now, quite a few. Ponds is another one. So every year we have these maps. Uh, I tried to uh, I pulled elk these or just moose this morning. I could have done a nicer job, but um, I tried to outline to some ponds. Um, and it you know, landmarks for it you on each. The best choice is the one on the left the is mule deer winter no range, and the one on the right is elk winter range. To turn these are models off, which I know are models based on so habitat. There's that. There's that. As to what is the primary winter range next year or valley. So red is there's not very high quality calf high use winter range, and the cooler temperatures as we have lost. That red to cooler temperatures it becomes a great way less to go. high quality winter um, habitat. So if you have so you can ponds, see in a lot of places, so we've got the little wood here getting drained. That's that can and then also the east fork is up here. Um, really help wildlife. You might notice out a lot of the south this, facing slopes. This situation in particular red. is hard because sometimes we have to make the decision is, whether it's snow burns off quicker to go there, out on the it's ice warmer, to try it's to rescue more mild animal. than those north facing it slopes isn't so a lot of our animals so are going to really be relying on those south west facing slopes that burn off and are a little bit easier for them to and we don't like doing, doing to it to survive the winter on um, but the valley has a lot and of it, some of you may have elk. heard we've put you out know, some press releases. Weather the winter quite as well as the elk do person in the got the shorter legs it's harder for them to move but we've um, We've been discovering way, way for several years now your weather especially in the valley. It's a very popular so a lot of them plants, are more migratory. Um, but the elk the, there is an ordinance that you can't plant you. Um, and a lot of that is a valley ordinance that you can't plant you. And a lot of it is um, land However, that all of us like to you go know, if you buy your plants from on. Home Depot, so down that, in, we're going to talk about the valley that in a little bit. Um, but again, just something they to sell keep in this. mind. And they market this it is as very zero scaping plant. It's range. very drought resistant. Um, to make it it's easy to grow. It's pretty. Um, this was interesting, though. I don't think the so red really talk a little bit up. about what you can do this now. This is all that we've set the groundwork. You is known to be one of the most if poisonous you can read that. in the world. Um, um, it's poisonous There's some home improvements you can it's do, and you can think of it kind of like child-proofing. So um, you can't tell wildlife. the deer and elk. So don't walk along really the side of my house and fall in the window well. That's around. dangerous. And we do you might need to do something about it to keep them from putting themselves and you in that very fast. So we'll find them with you still in their mouth. So the first one is cover your window So we are trying to do a lot of outreach. These are both from up here. By the Mike way, was up photos. here last winter. Um, did some I was walking not here around for the when moose. we had that the animals die from you started and found a um, bunch of wildlife management got back and out. tell the story. Uh, a lot of the local <laughs> nurseries. Will when work we're with done, you on I believe too. he was there. 
Um, but you know, this is dangerous for everybody, and it's okay, really unfortunate. I did have we, a picture um, from, I believe it was Elk Horn, of an elk come with up, her head in the garbage can, can them, which, um, requires which is not drugs, something that we typically for us, see. It's dangerous for them, um, but apparently there are and, some elk uh, that you have get to into move garbage. Them, but and more it's than just, that, it's, there's not a lot of reasons to secure that it is. We've lost beyond darting time. You know, in the summer you may have heard us talk about bears, and they can be in here for a while before we know they're there, and then they're really stressed. Or get a bear-proof container. Anyway, the best thing you can do if you think about your house, you know, and as the snow comes off um, the roof, it's, it's that certainly place right you know, next to your house. It's hard typically to keep all of your path least dog food and grills so animals and will garbage walk that and birds there's need no snow. It, you know, again, and it's all, all these things to think about. And in the case of the moose, um, she went clear but through securing the your garbage and ended up is a big one for public safety um, too, so because garbage can, can uh, just like grating or putting plywood, anything you can do to cover cover your window wells before winter time. And all of those are potentially very very helpful to wildlife. And Many of you hopefully Remove don't really want mountain lions under your porches or in your backyard. This one's hard because it's amazing yard. what can end up we being do have a lot of mountain lions in the valley. We have mountain lions of. that are living here year um, round, and they're having had kittens. At least two so they are around. Elk with and tomato cages the best, one of the best things you can as do you can is see, they just can prevent them from eating. eating. They can um, get in food the way, items so that we could win up and dart a and scare to get the tomato cage off of her head. That segues um, into don't had feed the wildlife, um, period. So, the, like, I know it's hard to look outside exactly and see the deer and the elk in the and the winter time. Like the macrame you want to help them, but feeding um, them is not helping this is, them. We just um, did this one oftentimes like three weeks ago. This bull elk had an entire tennis net wrapped around his whole length. So and the first thing feeding can do is concentrate. Was very, very tired animals. when we darted And you might start off feeding um, five deer, but that's so going to turn into 50 deer. Anything you can imagine, tomato could. cages, Do you have the means nets, to keep feeding the 50 deer? Um, and then it leads to competition. Sets, a lot of times Christmas the fawns lights, get kicked off um, the food anyway. If people and those are the ones call, that are really we tend to so tell them really if you... Feeding is something lights that above six you know is done the by the agency in a very around the tree all the way up. It's very pretty. We, we don't um, but like it's doing also it necessarily in particular. Um, and it's, and it's a tough deer, one. And people rub really their want help, but it's on not, the tree, and they'll get all tangled the, uh, up. Um, and sometimes it's okay. Sometimes they'll bullet, shed their antlers and they lose the, see it as. the lights, um, and it's fine. And but a lot of times, it can this get time of year, can neck, also end up killing them from wildlife. Eating. So they're um, again, they're just it's another one of those situations. Their digestive we can try and go and dart it, an or it will change. We might not be able so to. So in the winter time, in, case, in the like towards the end of the fall, from into the winter, or get very, very their gut biome changes. And that they do that because they're getting ready to, to basically one. fast through the winter. Every year so we have. They're uh, not used to rich food. Uh, elk or throw a bunch of alfalfa out there in February um, They or tend March, to be the ornamental ponds. actually kill them. And um, it, you know, it's like it a starving The best person. choice is if we you drain know, the ponds pond when there's no water in them. The has second lost that much water and aerators off, which them back I know keeps the fish alive. This, like, so great big deck there's, the, there's that, that that's uh, a conflict And the same thing can happen with the fish in there the next year, or do you want to keep it to where there's if not you throw this something out there for them, like apples, apples or anything, or anything like that, it can through. actually lead so, to some sickness. Or, um, we or have lost for the animals wildlife. in ponds. Not a great way to go. You know, it um, habituates so wildlife to people. Ponds, we have a lot of that. You know, it's almost like you've got to talk about all the different species and your, your mountain also, elk versus your um, town really elk or your mountain deer versus it is your this, town deer. This situation um, in particular a lot of you is hard probably have deer because and elk sometimes we have to make the decision whether it's close to them and they don't seem to go out and they become habituated to rescue that animal. And that's a whole nother. We don't want to habituate wildlife to take its course. That's a hard thing to prefer for them to keep what we all love about them, and that's that wildness. You know, they're not pets. And, and so, some of you, you may know, have heard we've put out some you, press releases. I, I was, again, I trying to think of ways we can relate person, to it. And not all people can be trusted. Um, but so we've, you don't we've not been discovering for several years now. You think in the valley it's a very popular that ornamental plant. Being on the road is actually um, okay. The, there is an ordinance um, again, that you can't for them plant and for us. Um, you, know, you don't I want them getting hit by cars on the road. You don't want to draw them down into that danger zone. You know, if you um, buy your plants from Home Depot and down in, I'm sorry, in the valley, I don't know if I already talked um, about it on this slide, but they again, sell back this. to the mountain lions. And they market you know, it as long as we have resident deer and elk plant. in the valley, we're out mountain lions. It's easy to grow. And that's it's just pretty. something to be aware of and know um, how to. This was interesting, though. I don't think the red really showed not up. Not only the this deer is not Penn State the extension. Yew is known to be one of the most poisonous woody plants in the world. So that kind of covers what I was going to talk about for what to do around your immediate house. To, or in um, town, wildlife. Now move into outdoor recreation so and wildlife. it's really not a great and plant to have around. And this is kind of a whole other subject that we year, have been struggling um, with. That eat you. Um, and, and that's kills that them all very, of us, fast. also at so Fish we'll and Game, we like to do all of these things too. Um, so we um, are trying I, to do and uh, you certainly a lot of outreach keep doing all of these um, things. But there's my responsibilities that come with recreating. And that's why I want at the end of the day, hopefully you all leave here. And got them all torn out. 
a lot of the local thinking about how work you can you think on about wildlife too. on a daily basis, especially when you're out in their habitat. Okay, and I'm going to focus on have a picture recreation from just that's the season it we're in, but this is of an elk with thing. her head all in the garbage year, you know, can. We, um, we like to be in the same places not something at the same that we time of year often see. Deer um, but apparently there you know, are what, some elk do you that get in the garbage. But more than that, there's a lot of reasons to secure your mountain country where cows are just winter calving. So in the summer, you may have heard us talk about bears. Again, think about how you keep your garbage We're very similar. We follow the same path throughout the year, and that brings us into overlapping with them a lot of times. Um, and I also and want to mention before I move on that this doesn't, know, I'm not going to keep like, all of your stuff contained. It's not motorized, it's not non motorized, it's not consumptive, you know, again, it's not all these things that all have about. an impact. Um, but it's securing your garbage is a big one for public safety too because garbage can, can bring there. in some meso predators, things like skunks. So this foxes, is a this is a cool little visual. Those are potential There's a lot going on. But it um, came out of some work that many of you um, Michael hopefully Wisdom don't really did. want mountain lions a under your porches or in your well known yard. researcher. We do have a lot Oregon, of mountain lions in the valley, um, and we have service. mountain lions that are living here and he's year done round. A lot of work on kittens. the impacts of recreation. So they are around. And to specifically the best, but this one of the best things you can do is to just wildlife, secure really. all of the um, um, food but items. This, this figure is specific to elk, so there are small prey. differences among the species and how that they react to That segues into don't feed the wildlife, period. Tend to so be a little I know it's hard to look to outside and see the deer and the elk than, than in the elk and deer. Um, um, but nonetheless, them, but feeding them is not helping them. They all will try to avoid Feeding oftentimes can create just a whole list of problems. So you can see again, to not focus on motorized versus non-motorized. That said, the first thing feeding can do is concentrate oftentimes groups of animals. And you might the start off feeding five distance, deer, so but that's going to turn into 50 deer. The arrows deer, mean it certainly could. Um, the arrows you have the means to keep feeding the 50 deer, runs away, and then it leads to competition. A lot of times the fawns activity. get kicked off the food anyway, so, um, and those are the ones that are like really these struggling. There's like these dark blue so arrows down here. Feeding is something the that colors aren't you know, really is done by the agency the in very unique situations. Show the natural distance that an elk keeps from that activity. It's a tough one, and people really want to help, but it's not. It's not the users on trail. Silver elk typically bullet, stand, some stay 960 see it yards away. Um, and improper so food like at this time mile. of year can also it's end kind up of killing wildlife. So they're, again, they're and ruminants. With biking, their digestive and system goes through a annual change. So and so in the wintertime, in the like it's 724 the yards. Winter, their gut biome for hikers, changes. it's 598 that, yards. They do that and because for, they're getting like, ready to, paved to, roads to basically with automobiles fast through the they winter. They typically stand and stay 437 They're not yards used away. to rich food. I know that's not the case. You're driving alfalfa out, out, out there in your off February, February or March. Right there. It could actually kill so again, them. habituated um, elk versus like a starving person. You know, there you are have differences. To, whenever but someone is has this lost is pretty, that much body pretty fat, compelling you have to work them back I don't up know how I tried to find like it before you big deck today. I don't know how many miles of roads it. and trail systems. And the same we thing can happen with deer and elk, pronghorn. I grew up in western moose. Colorado. Um, um, they just throw something out there, there like they, they map like forty thousand miles of sickness or death recreational wildlife. That includes roads and trails, both motorized and you know it habituates wildlife to people. Think about forty thousand. No, it's almost like you got to talk about all these species and then the distance that these animals are staying away. Elk or your mountain deer that versus impact your town deer quickly becomes um, a lot very of you large. probably have and deer and elk large in your backyard so you can get pretty close to them and they don't seem to mind they become habituated to people pretty interesting um, um, and that's that's a whole you nother know, again we don't want to habituate this is not to, to say people. that we should never go um, out we would prefer it's, for them it's to, to say keep that we at all certain times love about them and that's some that places maybe we shouldn't go pets um, and you so know, calving, you know, you get them places too used that are really and are I, important for calving. I was again trying to think of ways we can stay relate out of there to it. Not all June. people can be trusted. <laughs> so winter you range, don't necessarily want those some animals we might to, need to think try that to find all people alternative are safe places or to go. And there's a being lot of on the road like is that actually okay. Um, again, for them and for us, you know, you don't want them getting hit by cars okay. on the road. You don't want to draw so, them down into that danger So, a couple of things, and I, zone. you guys have probably all seen um, the pictures. Um, not and then I do any public I'm sorry, I don't today. know if I already talked about um, it on this slide, but, but again, the, back to the mountain the lions. Tourist, you know, as long uh, as we have resident deer and elk in the valley, we're going to have mountain lions. If you haven't seen them, and that's just something to be aware of. Know how they're, to they're funny and they're sad. Live responsibly <laughs> among um, not only and I, the deer and elk, but the predators that follow them. Just giving animals their distance, all three of these pictures. So that kind of covers what I was going to talk not, about for what to do around space. your immediate house. Um, or in town. Now I'm going to move into outdoor recreation is really, and wildlife. Really cool. And photography and tells a story. And this is kind of a whole right? nother subject that we have been so struggling with. It. Um, and but that's this is way too close. <laughs> also at Fish and Game, um, we like to know all of here with the elk. Um, Obviously, and I, the elk and is you giving him every can sign right now that he is way but too there's, close. There's responsibilities and that's a dangerous that spot for that snowmobile to be in. He could very and easily get hurt right there. And that's what I want. At the end of the day, hopefully, you all leave here. I don't know how that all ended up. 
And then the dogs thinking and wildlife, about how you can um, think that about one I could harp on, on for a while. I have dogs, especially when they're out in I their love hiking with my dogs. I hate having and them I'm on the leash on a lot of times, especially because that's two, the season we're in. But this is a year round where it's like all year. You know, we we like to be in the same places at the same time. But dogs can be really rough on wildlife. You know, what do you want to be down here with hot in summer? Do you want to be up in high elevation? All of you, mountain country where cows are. You know, this is not playing. You know, so some people again think about how you're just they're very similar. My dogs have. We fun. follow the same path. Well, the dog might be having fun, but that, oh, that dog looks a lot, like a lot of times. And any dog looks like a wolf. There's video and out I also there want to mention before I move on that this bear. doesn't, like, I'm not going to, they're, like, they're predators. It's not and motorized. And it's, it's not yeah, it's funny. non motorized. It's but not consumptive versus yeah, non consumptive. We and all it's have a little impact. dog. <laughs> and it's the dangerous it's just, one. But how can we mitigate um, those impacts? You know, these elk, deer, moose, they've all evolved for thousands of years. Wolves are one of the primary predators. So this is a cool little visual. Dogs look a lot like that. They're four legged predators lot going on. They but it came out of research that, that dogs um, have a bigger did. impact a if you're alone on a trail. Well-known researcher it's just you, out of Oregon, that animal is less um, likely to flee service. a farther distance and than he's if you done have a dogs lot of work off leash on the impacts of, of recreation. They really focus in on the dogs. So and specifically I've seen this elk, but this applies to and all wildlife. They'll, really. they'll watch the dogs. They um, don't care about but me this, at all. This they are really keen on those dogs. So there are small differences among the species and how they react to my dog. I had to go through e to be a little more resilient to having people around than absolutely been not okay, um, and, but and nonetheless, we went through the electric shock training all with her. Try to avoid um, for so the that I didn't part. always have to have her on um, leash. So you can see again to not to whatever not focus it takes, on motorized whether it's dog on leash or e collar or leaving them at home. Motorized sometimes. does I'll oftentimes home result sometimes when I'm going out in the to farthest stuff flight distance. With deer so the arrows, the arrows mean. And um, she's the arrows show how far it's not okay. Runs so, away, um, basically. You know, from what would you do if activity? dogs chased your kids? So you, know, you think um, about some of these. I know there's this is like below, these dark blue arrows you know, down as a, here as a cow moose, and the colors what are you really do offset. offset if, but the dark blue arrows here calf. show well, the natural distance the moose, that an elk turn around keeps and from that activity. Um, so, so for ATV, safer for your pet, motorized users, stress from the trails. It's Elk also been shown, stay and I'm sorry if I'm jumping around a lot here, away. Um, so that's like a half but mile. But people who are hiking that's with dogs off way. leash, on trails, and then the with biking, bears, have and a, or multi, that's you're putting yourself in danger. So there. A lot of times the dog biking, runs up the trail, it's 724 yards, acts aggressive to the bear. For hikers, the bear it's 598 the dog, the dog yards, runs back to you, and, for, and then the bear like jumps your on paved you. roads um, with automobiles. So there's been they some research that's come out that, that um, away. looked at all the different bear attacks. I know that's not the case as you're driving across North America. Through here, often um, over 50% right of them, it was a dog. So again, habituated elk versus non-habituated. So another reason to keep your dog at least close to you. Again, this is pretty pretty compelling because e I don't know how I tried um, to find it before the presentation because it's, today. It's I don't know how many miles of roads and trail systems we have in Idaho. Um, I grew up in Western you know, Colorado. Back to the winter um, stuff. They just if did you a couldn't get a drink there, they, the they mapped 40,000 miles to go, of that would routes. Be. Uh, recreational routes right. that includes um, roads and sometimes and trails, these wi the wildlife gets pushed into less think about 40,000 habitat because miles you know in Idaho a lot of and our then trails the distance and that roads these animals run along right here in areas riparian areas impact are super productive and they're very really large important and it's a large wildlife. potential um, loss and habitat. so again just being cognizant of where you're going and, and looking pretty to interesting see, you know um, is there wildlife where i'm planning you know, on again going? can i go somewhere else this is not to say um, that we should never go out this is not to it's, say it's don't to go say outside. that at certain times as you do some know, places know maybe we the shouldn't wildlife go is out there and, um, and maybe you know calving places that are really important for calving might need to stay out of there till the end of june too long but Winter Why range. people move? This was Some an article in the New York might need Times. We're trying to find alternative calmer. places to go. And there's, there's a lot of places, of places like that around here. That is the trail. You know, as the trail gets busier and busier, they're going to move out. Um, okay. So it's just important us for to recognize so that we are. So a couple of things, and all, I, you guys have you know, probably all seen the, the pictures. Um, I'm not going to do any public shaming So what should you do when you're out recreating? Um, well, the first thing I tell people is look before you go. You know, websites for binoculars. If you have seen them, they're sad and they're funny in their hillside. Take some time. Look, are there deer up there? You know, if there are, again, there's lots of hillsides. Just giving animals there's lots their of distance, places we can go where there aren't pictures. deer. None of that's those. happening. And we're, it not, is we're not giving them their it, space. It, it, I understand um, it can be inconvenient. Um, but photography the difference for is you really, is really that cool. You can go somewhere else. Photography they tells really a story. Can't. And if they right, do, they're expending all love energy. to get the picture. 
so, so that you can um, remember just it. look before you go if you but see wildlife way either close. wait <laughs> you can wait a little bit um, if they're the moving snowmobile are here the, with the elk around the hillside obviously you can just wait the elk is giving him else. every sign right now you can that he is way too close or you can go somewhere else and that's else. a dangerous spot for that snowmobile again, to be in don't need he to reiterate but get hurt right your dogs and maybe he did i don't know how i ended up um, you and know, then the dogs and wildlife. Think about them. Um, that one I could harp on for a while. And I have dogs. There, they give me a lot of signals. I love that hiking they don't with my dogs. Like I hate having them. having them on the leash a lot of times. Um, same as like your dog. But it's is such a pain. And there's Tackles places where it's like dangerous for your dogs on a leash. If they're running away. Um, you know, dogs and animals can be really rough on wildlife. Um, and just this is think something about what you know. I mean, a lot are of they, in the room. Are they nervous? All of us, are they scared? Scared? Are they getting um, aggressive? You know, this is not playing. Um, you, know, you know, I know I think some if people we pay are a little more attention to what they're, they're just, telling they're us. They're just having fun. Um, My dog's really help fun. them out. Well, the dog might be having fun, but that elk, that dog looks a lot I like wolf. Might come and back any to dog this looks to like see how wolf. There's video out there talking. of a chihuahua chasing a black bear. But I do have an bear. Instagram like, clip. Some of you may have seen they're it. They're predators. It's about a park ranger. Have, I think he's in, call, yeah, it's he's funny. in Smoky Mountain, actually. But there's, there's people that are getting yeah, really close to the elk. It's and the he little has a really dog. good rule <laughs> that I've never heard. But if you hold up your... If you hurt, hold you know, up your elk, if it can cover the elk for thousands of years, um, you are, are one of close. the primary predators on right? the landscape. Too, no, dogs look other a lot way like around. that. They're four legged If it covers predator. the elk, you're good. If it They've doesn't, you're through too the close. research that dogs um, have so a, a bigger good, impact good if you're fun, alone on a trail. And it's just you. Um, I included this link less for those of you if you want to go back and watch this you have dogs after the talk running on your own you. time. They really focus in on the dogs. To a video and I've seen this when I'm out. Habitat biologists out of and Boise, Krista they'll, they'll Bjorn, watch the dogs. Put on, they don't um, care about me at all. The they are really keen on these dogs across um, all winter range. And it's well worth the watch. So my dog, I had to go through really cool training with her. She chased deer. She talks about everything. Absolutely, it's not okay. And and but it's really pretty video. Electric shock training with her. So you think about it. I didn't back. Always have to have her on a leash because sometimes Christa, I can't. Christine but puts on the whatever um, it takes, whether it's and, dog uh, on a leash or an e collar or leaving them at home. Sometimes I'll leave her at home. So to kind of wrap up, to do just a few things to leave you with. Um, as her. you're out, just and acknowledge she's all of us to chase what we can wildlife. Do, is it's acknowledge okay. that you do so, have an impact. Um, you know, but there's things what we would can you do with dogs so chasing Show restraint when you're out. Think about again if you go somewhere else while you're recreating. Do that as a cow moves. Find an alternative. What are you going to do? You'll help a wild animal in doing that. Calf. So well, every time wildlife the moves, she's going to turn around and trample the dog. They're um, all of our so responsibility. So it's, it's safer for of. your pet. You know, it's not just and it removes a group of people. From wildlife. It's not just the. It's also been shown the hikers and, and bikers. Sorry, it's, it's not just around the hunters. Here. It's not just um, the the but you know, people who are out animal with dogs lovers, off leash. All of us. If we want on trails that to encounter bears, respect them. We need to to take that's responsibility. You're putting yourself in danger there. A lot of times, the dog runs up the trail. Um, acts another thing. To the bear, when the bear Kristen chases the, the dog, the dog up. runs back um, to you, and then the bear jumps on you. There's a few resources here um, that are well worth checking out. So there's out. been some research that's actually seen that's it, but that, Haley um, did a really all the nice different bear attacks um, across North America. Living with wildlife um, in the winter. Over 50% of them, it was a dog um, that involved. I just found yesterday. So it's, it's really, really good. Um, so, so another reason to keep your dog at We have a Wood River Valley Wildlife Smart Communities Coalition. That's quite the mouthful. Just got started. Because it's it's still in its very beginning stages. But we have a website. And that is you know, a group back to the that's getting stuff. started if by you get a drink uh, local or go to the citizens that are just very passionate about to wildlife. Go, that would be um, the hope is to add feeling. in some educational um, content and sometimes for people. These the wildlife people gets pushed to. into less um, high quality get habitat more because, with that group. You, you know, in Idaho, a lot of our trails I mean, I can and give roads run along riparian areas. And then, of course, our riparian areas are super productive, and they're really we've got a really great communications team that puts out regular media and being cognizant of where you're going and and looking. And I know that's hard. You can get your information. From, from all over the website going? now, can and I go like somewhere you're else? inundated with as um, much info as again, is out there. Again, this is not like, to right, say don't wrong. go outside. This is a good place it's to just go. As you do, know, hopefully know that the wildlife is, is out right. there and, and um, maybe take them into consideration and, while you're you out know, there. I, I don't know if you can subscribe to weekly emails well, or not, too long. But, but if you just get in the habit of going here every once in a while, this was an article in the New York Times where happier are doing more videos. Why young adults are moving out of late, and so that is the trail. You know, as the trail gets busier and busier, they're going to move out. And then with that, so it's. Um, important I don't us know for how many of you read the Mountain are, Journal. It's, we're all, it's a pretty you know, good sharing the same way on some things. And there's so what some should you do when you're out recreating? Well, the first thing wildlife. I tell people is look before um, you go. Todd Wilkinson had a, you know, had a nice quote in there, there that just, just says, you know, basically, the hillside real quick before there are you go some ski, places at some times of the year that maybe take some time. Alone, look, and that's okay. It doesn't mean we have to if stop doing anything. There's lots of hills. All the things we love to do. There's lots of places we just can go with our deer. Go to one of those, and it is inconvenient. It, 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 I understand yeah, it can be very much. Um, yeah. But the difference for you is that you can go somewhere else, they really can't. And if they do, they're expending energy. 
So um, just look before you go. If you see wildlife, either wait. You can wait a little bit. If they're moving around the hillside, you could just wait for them to go okay. somewhere else. You can reroute okay. yes. or you can go somewhere else. Yes. Again, don't need to reiterate, but just leash your dogs. Never approach wildlife. Um, you know, mm -hmm. think about the body language that an animal is giving you. A lot of times they give you a lot of signals that they don't like how close you are to them. Um, same as like your dog that's nervous, mm -hmm. hackles yeah. raised, ears back, yeah. if they're running away. Yeah, no. You know, anytime an animal is reacting to your presence, um, just think about what that means. Are they, are they nervous? Are they scared? Are they getting aggressive? Um, you know, I think if we pay a little more attention to what they're telling us, um, that can really help. That's a really out. good question. And it's those like those those quick encounters I that might can come back to this the to see hardest how long ones, I've been talking. You didn't do anything wrong. <laughs> but I do have an Instagram um, clip. Some of you may yeah, have seen so it. So in that case, it's about a park I guess what I would say he's in Colorado. He's in Smoky Mountain. Actually, maybe we should put people like, that are as really long as people are aware there's a really good rule. At least going into it knowing if you hold up your so if you hold up your thumb if it can cover the elk something like that just to alert you are too close. Um, carry right? bear spray, no. even when you're way around. or out. If it covers the elk, bear you're good. Spray is really if it good doesn't, you're too everything. close. Um, um, it, so that's it, well, a good I've heard mixed reviews, to be honest, on moose as to how well it works. But I, um, it's I better than this nothing. link for those of you if you um, want to go back you and watch this, this situation after the talk you know, on your own time. This is she does a charge. link to a video that our Habitat Practice said that they do sell practice canisters. put on. I had never used bear spray. I kept telling people, hey, bear across all winter And know how to use it. But I had never used it until last year. There's some really um, cool finally practice with it, and wildlife, it's definitely she like takes about a second everything to get that used to. Already covered so today. I'd say carry um, bear spray. But it's a really pretty video. Um, it's got a lot know, of great moose, information. Typically, if you don't you get about it, just come back her, to the link calf, which sometimes, uh, as Christine you said, on, that uh, could happen um, website and, and uh, had no chance. Check it out. Um, you know, in that case, just try so to back to kind of wrap up. Just a few things they will. A lot of animals just acknowledge all of us. What we can do is acknowledge that we do have an impact. But they're just warning you, and if you react appropriately. It. And you back so away slowly, slowly when you're out. And you don't Again, corner if you can go somewhere else while you're recreating, out do that. of the way of her and her calf. Find an alternative. Um, and you'll help, to, you'll help a wild animal in doing their that. own way. They're, they're so everyone's naturally, wildlife, naturally they most wildlife everybody. species are pretty um, shy. They're um, all of our But yeah, that's a tough one to take care of. It you know, is because sometimes you can do everything right and not just the in the wrong The hikers and bikers, it's not just the hunters, it's not just the, you know, Devout animal lovers, it's no, all No, don't us. turn your back you to them, don't run. To, no. Respect them and we nope. need to, it's to get take out of their responsibility quickly, for how we all have an impact. Yeah, don't run. And you know, for moose, um, moose aren't another like a predator. thing. So when running it doesn't necessarily trigger up. like an instinct. Um, I just tell people don't turn your back to here them. here that are well worth checking out. You want to be able out. to see what I hadn't what actually seen it, but Haley really did a really nice kind of gauging, um, like a she living with wildlife in the winter because you will never outrun any of them um, that I just found. Yeah, yesterday. especially if you're it's, on it's skis, really, really that good. would be really so hard. We have a Wood River Valley Wildlife Smart Communities Coalition. That is a hard one. Mouthful just got started. It's still in its very beginning stages, yes. um, yeah. but we have a Definitely. website, yeah. and Bear that is a group that's getting started by uh, local too. citizens that are just very passionate about wildlife. Oh, um, I'm the sorry. Hope is I'm to supposed to be repeating add the questions. I already forgot. Content for people, a resource um, for people to, to go to. Okay, so that question um, was: If you want to get involved more, um, does with that bear spray group, work for you mountain lions? After. Yes, it does. I um, mean, I can give you some more information, and then of course our our website, Fish and Game. We've got a really great communications team that puts out regular media and, and press releases. And I know that's hard. You can get your information from all over the website sure. now. And it's like, yeah, so he asked about um, the numbers of like, ungulates right, and predators. This is a good place um, to go. I'll try to talk a little bit about Hopefully like our residential is right. numbers um, as well as the and, greater you know, ecosystem I, I don't know us. if you can subscribe um, to so weekly emails or not. We do have increasing numbers of residential deer and elk, um, at least over the last 50 years. They're becoming more habituated. There was a lot of feeding that was going on and then um, with that like residential um, feeding I don't know how many of you read the mountain uh, journal animals it's, that become habituated there's some there's potentially some benefits there's to an animal living in town on winter recreation um, and wildlife because um, and there is like this constant a, source had a nice food. quote and in there also that predators says, you know, tend to avoid people there are so some places at some there's been instances where ungulates have learned like that's okay actually we have to stop doing anything i don't have to do all the things when i'm in town so i'm going to think about where and when we're doing and there could be some of that too there was a shift you know in that, in ungulate behavior with the reintroduction yeah. of wolves. Um, you know, so there was some of that going on as well. We do have increasing numbers. 
I don't know how many exactly in the valley. We talked about this a little bit beforehand too, but um, you know, we've heard 400 to 600 elk okay. maybe in the valley. Okay. Um, it's hard yes. to say for sure. Yes. Mike will correct me if I'm wrong on any of this because he's been here 32 years. Um, we've got the predator numbers mm -hmm. in town. I would love to know. Um, predators are super, super hard to monitor and count, as you can imagine. Um, we're working on some mm -hmm. stuff in other parts yeah. of the state, um, yeah. like wild country, yeah, forest, no, and, and those not in town, but with trail cameras to see if we can count wolves, which we've successfully been able to do. Um, now we're moving on to bears and mountain lions to see if we can count them using trail cameras. We might be able to try something that like that. That's in a really town good question. Some point. Those um, like those those quick there's encounters. There's lots of that really can cool statistical the models ones, for you counting didn't do animals wrong. now that are showing um, lots of promise. And, um, yeah. So in that we case, do know that I we've guess got at least three female lions up and down the valley right it, now. Maybe like, four. As long as people are aware there's a moose, have are at least going into it. So that's kind of a lot. And mountain lions are territorial, so naturally that just to alert people limits their the density. bear spray. But Even urban mountain lions might be a different story. Winter, bear from, spray is really good um, for everything, lions up in the hills. Um, it, and it will. That's a I've lot of lions reviews, to have in a fairly small area. area. How well it works, um, but I, you know, it's and we've better than a couple um, of toms. And if you find yourself years, in a situation, male where, mountain lions, you know, she's um, she does so charge. You I can really don't know that. the numbers, but practice with it. They do sell practice canisters. There's a lot of lions. I had never used bear spray. The bears seem to kind of fluctuate with the conditions. And know how to use it, but I had never used it until last year. So as you can imagine, finally to get Bear it. and it's definitely in like takes a second town, to get if used it was to. a bad so berry year I'd say carry bear spray um, they're just looking um, you know, for food typically so the bear numbers get in town seem to fluctuate calf, with the conditions which sometimes as you said that could we happen estimate like 20 to 30,000 no black chance. bears in the state um, um, you know in that for this case, area we're kind of in the try southern to back end slowly. of black bear a lot of times they in Idaho you know the plane is a lot of animals so we don't have a bear charge south of the plane and that's scary so we're kind of in the low to medium you and if you react appropriately and you back away slowly it's nothing like what's and you up don't in corner the her and you try to put yourself um, in the clear out water of the way regions. of her and her calf. Um, um, so for outside, to, for to for go their own way in the they're, greater they're naturally, area. Naturally, naturally, um, most wildlife Highway 75 is the barrier for. Um, um, but yeah, that's a tough one. Elk by zone yeah. it is because so sometimes you can do everything right is and you're the still smoky Bennett in the wrong spot elk zone. at the wrong time. And to the east is the Pioneer Elk Zone. Yes. So we count elk different. We count them separately. No, don't turn your back to them. Um, don't run. And that's a little bit no. of like an administrative nope. thing. It's, but get it's out also of there we're trying to mimic biology too. So. Where elk and, are you know, moving for the majority moose, of the year and moose where they aren't winter. like a predator. We just so counted our pioneers elk doesn't necessarily trigger elk like an last instinct year. I just tell people don't so turn your back to unit 49, which you is want to the be able unit to from what, Trail what Creek she's down doing Blizzard with her Mountain ears to Highway 20, kind of gauging like a sheep. So it's she kind of starting big area. to run at me because you will never I'm outrun talking forever about that because I especially if you're numbers, that would be really hard. I think it's like elk we counted in unit 49. Yeah, but that is a whole entire zone. Um, which is three units. It goes all the way up to Chalice yes. over to Mackey. Yeah. So it's Definitely. a big area. Is over yeah, nine. Bear spray elk. works for for um, darn near so everything. Second People largest elk herd in the we state. Tell everybody. Um, the pioneer elk. They're doing really oh, well. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm supposed um, to be Smoky repeating Bennett questions. Elk. I already forgot. We counted those a few years ago. Um, that includes. To, okay, so that question was. So sorry. Um, includes all the way over spray to work for mountain um, lions. Yes, it mountain does. Home. And down to the interstate, and then up to like yes. Pine Featherville, kind of that whole area. I think we counted, it's been a few years, but like 3,000, 3,500 elk, I think, in there. Um, deer, we have not flown sure. for a long time. Yeah, so he asked Our about deer, we um, the, the numbers of ungulates where and predators. We take all the GPS um, radio I'll try to talk a little so bit about like our residential in this area over the numbers last 10 years. as well as the We look at that collar data and how elk or deer use the um, landscape over the so year and then build these population boundaries. We do have increasing numbers um, of residents that, that we're going to manage deer on, on this um, big at least over the last 50 years. And so we're set to becoming more habituated. There was a lot of feeding that was going on next year. Like residential um, feeding. So, um, uh, to your question, animals though, that become habituated, there's some right here. We, when we flew the elk, there were probably like two to three thousand deer in um, unit 49. So that because there trail is like this constant to, source um, of food, and, over and also to predators tend um, to so avoid quite a few deer so on those south. There's been instances the where slopes. ungulates have learned like people are actually yeah. safer. <laughs> I don't yes. have to deal with wolves when I'm in town, so and I'm going to be in town. For a while. I'm sorry. And there could and be some of that too. There was a shift, you know, in in ungulate behavior with the reintroduction of wolves. Um, you know, so there was some of that going on as well. 
We do have increasing numbers. I don't know how many exactly in the valley. We talked about this a little bit beforehand too, but um, you know, we've heard 400 to 600 elk maybe in the valley. Um, it's hard to say for sure. Mike will correct me if I'm wrong on any of this because he's been mm -hmm. here 32 That's years. That's a really good question. Um, so a lot of we've got what gets hard is that the there's predator multi, numbers in town. Sorry, I would love Kristen. to know. <laughs> um, um, predators the are question super, was, super hard to uh, monitor Is there anything that we can be doing as, as we plan development um, or moving we're working forward, on especially in other focus on the state, southwest um, slopes we've like identified as important to wintering forests. wildlife? What can we do as we move forward in development trail cameras? to see if we can count the tough wolves, thing with this which we've with successfully the valley been able to do that a lot of um, now we're moving on to bears and mountain lions winter closures would be beneficial is managed we by might be able to try something that, like that in uh, town at some point so um, is a primary one around here the bureau there's Land lots of really cool um, statistical the, models well, for cities, counting animals now that are showing a lot of promise a lot of the jurisdictional we do know that we've got at least three so fishing game managers and wildlife right now maybe four that have four that have you know we are a so so we provide um, that's kind of a lot uh, and, and when mountain lions are territorial um, so naturally to, that you know, kind of the impacts to wildlife will be their, if the, development the density like trail building but urban mountain lions and that type might of thing be a occur we do provide from, comment for that um, lions um, but at the, the end of the day we don't have that's a lot of lions to have in a fairly small area, area. Um, I think you know, there are certainly things the we can do. Of toms, I think over the we years, know plenty of male mountain lions um, to um, make so educated. I really don't know the numbers, numbers but it moves forward. We've lost a lot, of a lot of lions winter range in already. town. Um, the you bears know, seem the to kind of fluctuate with the now. conditions. It's changed in the fall, a lot in the summer and fall, um, and we're not the only ones. So as you can you imagine, know, there's a lot to of get places, more bear calls in the summer Wyoming in and town. Um, very similar it was a bad berry year, topography or a dry year, and um, community just looking and for food. And, so the bear numbers you know, why in town people seem move to fluctuate there with the is very similar to here. Um, and so I think we, we estimate have a lot like 20 to 30,000 black bears in the state. To do. Um, for this Whether area, we're kind of in the southern end not, of you know, black is bear what people country decide in Idaho, they value you know, the most. plain is a barrier, so yeah. we don't have bears south of the plain. Yes, sorry. Um, yeah. So we're kind of in low to medium density bear area here. Mm -hmm. It's nothing like what's up in the panhandle um, in the clear water regions. Mm -hmm. um, so for outside, for, for ungulates in the greater area. <laughs> That's a great question. Um, so two questions. Um, the, the first one was do mountain lions uh, uh, manage sleep elk in the trees during the day? So, um, so to that the question west is the Smoky uh, Bennett typically elk no. zone. Um, they and will the definitely the pioneer get up into zone. trees. So we I count a lot of the times we lions count them separately. Trees. Um, if um, there's something that's going a little on the bit ground, of like, like an administrative that, that's thing, like an but it's also route for them. we're trying they to mimic tree. biology too. Um, so we just where elk uh, are Mike and I drove the around where they winter a couple weeks ago. We just talking counted to our about pioneers all these lion elk sightings last and year. Interactions we've so that had includes over the last Unit 49, which is and the unit one of from the trail we creek who down that there is a place I can't remember where it was, but that mountain lions were in the trees above the mailboxes. Right, talking forever about that because <laughs> um, I don't remember the so exact numbers. People knew, like, they told all like the neighbors and stuff. We counted um, so they will in utilize unit trees, but more often um, than the that, whole they entire look zone, for, um, like um, which is cubby three units areas. that goes all the way up to um, Chalice, so like under or porches to that don't have so big areas right, over nine thousand without anything blocking um, it off. So that second we tell people to do, if you have a porch, block it off so that mountain lions can't get under there. The Smoky Bennett elk, especially when the snow piles up a few years ago, they can dig. You know, they can dig under there, and that's a perfect day bed. All the way over to, um, um, and we've had lots of Mount people Home who like and down to the interstate, and then I, maybe up I to like say a lot, but we've had kind of that a handful area. of people who had lions day bedding years, under their like porch, and they had no idea until the dog went in there and barked elk, at the mountain lion. Or, um, um, so yeah, deer, more often than that, they're looking for a long for time. Like the, as the shrubs we manage at a level where it's mature and take all the GPS radio collar data, so we've called hundreds of deer in this area over the last ten years. Um, we look at that collar like data and how elk or deer, deer use like the landscape over here and then build these population boundaries. The second boundaries. question, I'm sorry, can you um, remind me? With the idea that we're going to manage deer on, a, on this big population mm. level. Um, yeah. And so we're set to fly. Yeah. It's this huge, it's a huge area that we're going to have to fly next yeah. year. Um, yeah, so the so, question um, was, to your question though, <laughs> the question, that question right was, here, we, when we elk have taken up there residence probably in your backyard, like two especially to three thousand deer, it sounds in like, and they're coming so there year after year, is there anything you can do to discourage um, them? Over to Bellevue. I think if you find um, out a way so to quite do a few that, deer let us know, because south, that's something, the um, there's a few things you can do, you know, we can, um, yes. we regularly, yeah. 
You've had your if it's a, for a if it's a public <laughs> safety issue, you. we will haze. We'll try to haze animals. The problem, which is so hazing, is if you go in and you like try to scare them out. You make loud noise. We'll use rubber buckshot, which sounds bad, but it inflicts a little pain and chases them off. They associate that place with a little bit of pain. The problem in the valley is that if you do that in your yard, they move to the neighbor's yard, and then the same problem exists. And so, it is a constant kind of struggle. Um, you know, it, identifying reasons they're there mm -hmm. are probably things you don't want to really get rid question. of. So but a like, lot of, like it's hard is that nice there's mulch uh, or like sorry, food Kristen. item that they love that they're, they're um, eating. The question um, was, it's hard uh, is there anything that we can be doing can as we plan it, development or um, moving forward, you know, especially elk, to focus on those southwest like slopes we've identified trees, as important to wintering wildlife? What can we do as we move forward? But again, those are things you may not want to get rid of or remove. The tough thing tends to be reasons with the valley is that a lot of water source close by, any of those winter closures would be beneficial. I don't know that I have a good answer for you on how of different out of there. Uh, agencies. So BLM yes. is the primary one around here, the Bureau of Land Management. Um, the counties and the, well, the cities, I guess. The cities mm -hmm. and the BLM have a lot of the jurisdictional authority on some of this winter range. Mm -hmm. So Fish and Game manages the wildlife, but we don't manage the land. Um, and, you know, we are a, we provide yeah uh, yeah so the question was is that they're getting ready um, ITD is getting ready to widen know, what the impacts to wildlife will be if um, development and especially that will like have trail building on wildlife and that type of thing occur we do that provide a bigger barrier for that. than already is and we um, but at the end of the day we don't have control over what um, happens on that ground you know in um, some areas I think there are the certainly things answer we can to do. that is easier I think we know plenty here it's fairly difficult because to create crossing structures for wildlife on 75 you're going to have lost a lot of very very winter long range way. already um, and um, then you have you all know, these driveways the and roads that come now out that we're not going to be able to fence um, and, so and we're not the only ones you know there's a lot of places there, they may not use Wyoming and um, very the most effective way topography the, and what makes uh, community highway and, crossing so and, effective and, you know is why people move to that there spot is very similar to here and that's just I think we have a lot of I can't think of how that would work here unfortunately whether so that there's a few other not, you know, technologies out there that could potentially be used. Most. They're not they're not yeah. they they're not as good as overpasses. Yeah, you know, overpasses yeah. can reduce highway mortality by ninety percent. Mm -hmm. um, there's things that they use in Banff, and we're getting ready, I believe, to implement over in Island Park, which detects when an animal is on the highway, and then signs <laughs> light up. Great question. So two questions. On the, highway. Um, the first one was: Do um, mountain lions those uh, are more sleep effective in the trees than the stationary, stationary signs um, that we have? So that, that question is uh, you may not even typically have seen because they're stationary. Um, they will definitely every single sign get up into try to road. I think a lot but of we the have times some lions get in the, the trees, valley that say, you know, um, if there's something going on the ground that like. That, those that's just like an escape they route for them. I'm very well optimistic about those types um, of signs. We but just, uh, Mike and I something drove like around that could be a couple weeks ago future. talking to people um, about it's all expensive. these lion sightings. It doesn't and work in all places, had, especially last places month. that get really cold. And one and of the hot. people we there's talked to said that there is a place, I can't remember where it and was, I'm but the mountain lions were in the trees above the mailboxes. That's a potential option. So, and people knew, they told all the neighbors and stuff. So they will utilize trees, but more often than that, they look for our pronghorn um, like and our deer, especially areas. some of them are crossing five um, so highways like under porches that summer don't have range. raised porches. Some of our deer are summering clear up it off at the top That's of Galena we and winter all the way down by our office block and drop so that so mountain lions can't huge get under there because it's mile. especially when the migration snow piles you up, can imagine as you think about what dig, that landscape you know, they can looks dig under there and then it's this perfect the number of fences the number of developments we've had lots of people who train tracks irrigation canals maybe I should say a lot but we've had a handful of people who've had lions day bedding under their porch but, and they had yeah. no idea and dogs the off dog leash. went in there and barked so. at the mountain lion or um, yes. so yeah more often than that they're looking for like the as the shrubs in your yard if they're big mature and they fold mm -hmm. over with the snow those are other places that lions mm -hmm. can get back into yeah. um, anything that's like dark and cubby like they mm -hmm. like to day bed there the second question I'm sorry can you remind me yeah that's a good question I know yeah. My, uh, oh, yeah. yes. The question was this, the elk at Sun Valley. I'm really bad at that. Yeah. The elk at Sun Valley. Yeah, so the question the was getting fed. <laughs> um, question. It's that a question was is if of elk. elk have taken up residence in your backyard, Mike, especially I know during the rut, me about this like, before, but that's been going, going on for a long time. Is there anything right? you can do to discourage them? I think if you find out a way a to do that, let us know there. because that's um, something. Um, a year there's a few things you can do. You know, we can, we regularly. 
If it's a the if it's a public safety issue, we will haze. We'll try elk. to haze animals. Um, the problem, which is so hazing, case, is if you go I'm in and you like that they're not doing try to scare them out, you make loud noise. We'll use rubber buckshot, which sounds bad, but it inflicts a little pain and chases them feed. off. They associate that place with so, a little bit of pain. Um, the problem in the valley is that if you do that in your yard, they, they move could to be. the neighbor's I, I yard. I don't know in that specific situation. So that might be something we're going to look at right now. It is a constant kind of struggle. Um, yeah. You know, yeah. it, identifying reasons they're there um, are probably things yeah, you don't want to uh, get elk rid of. With livestock like, is never nice a good thing. Any nice forage or um, like food item that they love that they're they're eating, um, right. it's hard if you can wrap it or if mm -hmm. you can remove it. Um, you know, elk. Particularly There's a bunch of different like reasons. Trees. Um, a lot of people have aspen trees. They'll come in with the buds. Is one. That kind of thing. But again, those are things you uh, disease, may not want to get rid of. Diseases or that wildlife um, can carry that are transmittable to livestock why there, if and then vice versa. Close by, um, of oftentimes, things, Sierra alluded to competition at feed lines. For you on how to keep them out um, we've had multiple, yes. and this is terrible, but we've had multiple instances of bull elk killing livestock, mm -hmm. um, goring. Um, mm -hmm. So, for those reasons, when we have those situations, and this now this is a little bit different. When they get yeah. in cattle feed yeah, lines, yeah. So the question really was, nervous. is that they're getting ready? Um, IT is getting ready to widen highway horses 75. Horses is a little bit different, um, but and that will have impacts on wildlife. Um, take a look at, but they certainly have not is, reached out to us for assistance. That gets hit on the road. So. Um, but those are the two of the big reasons. You know, in some areas, the answer to that is easier. Yes. Um, here, it's fairly difficult because to create crossing structures for wildlife on 75, you're going to have to fence a very, very mm -hmm. long way. Um, and then you have all these driveways mm -hmm. and roads. Yeah, the that question come out was that we're not going to be able to fence. Especially in a winter so like this winter, to set up feeding sites all those throughout the valley. They may not use spots. The, Overpass. Um, she the mentioned most effective Creek. way. Um, um, so we what we makes try our very best to not so feed whenever we can. But in the case of public safety, if there's um, if there's a concern just, of them on roadways, I can't think of how that we have done. Here, unfortunately, feeding in the past. Um, um, so there's a few other technologies the out there that can um, potentially especially be like used. if you guys they're not in the they're not they, winter, they're not as good uh, a lot of animals were just standing you know, overpasses on the road that reduced the place there was no highway snow. mortality by so we 90%. did feed that winter um, across the valley um, there's things that they use and a lot in of that was to keep them off of getting roads ready i believe to implement out of development park which we do feed on the highway for that very reason we do have our only state sanctioned feed site is here in the valley um those are more effective than the stationary signs that we started and has continued as a way to not even elk out have of seen because they're stationary and who um, reads every single sign for public on the side of the road. And but so we have we, some we feed elk the there every that winter. say, you know, um, wildlife crossing to 200 elk. Those just don't. It's quite expensive. Don't I'm very pessimistic it does concentrate about those types of signs. But um, potentially animals in something town like that comes with a lot of trade-offs. You know, for um, public safety, it can be worth it. It doesn't for work in just all trying places, to keep especially places alive places at the really end. cold and the feeding hot. never. There's all these things to overcome. And I'm not an engineer, engineer, and I'm not sure I guess how it works here, but I can that's think of a to put it to, to actually help the population on that highway. Because that um, is a lot of times by the time we start, feeding and we do have a lot of animals, animals. You know, when we it's talked about migration, late. our callers, um, if we start feeding our even now, deer, especially to get a some of them are crossing but if we five start highways in like February, summer and winter range. A lot of times, some of our deer fawns and clear up that are already at the top of Galena and winter all the way down by our office and Jerome. And the adults are pretty resistant to winter. I mean, cow elk migration. We have like ninety eight. Think about what that landscape cow looks elk. between there and here. Um, they do very the well fences, through the winter. The number so of we're developments, the number feeding of roads, is never a train solution to like rescue canals, a population, um, farm you ground. You might potentially um, help a couple of individuals, more, but it's not going to help yeah. your your dogs off leash of deer or elk. So um, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, and I think that the um, the the feeding is just arguably like some of the feeding that's already happened has changed migration routes, and that's like why they're <laughs> yeah, wintering that's here. That's a good question. Um, I know you know we had a lot of residential uh, oh, feeding yes. going on over the years. The question was the elk and at some of Sun Valley in, inadvertent. You know, the elk at Sun elk Valley at the stables for, getting for deer fed, for, um, and it's becoming and, a fairly large and group cattle, of elk. and people just aren't you keeping them out. to Mike, so they're not I know he's told me about this before, but that's been going on for a long time, right? But it ended up creating these groups of elk that know the feed is there. There's a history of feeding up there. Then their calves um, know the feed is there. And it becomes a, a generational thing. And so we've probably um, already altered that 
some behavior ceased. by doing that. Um, so again, feeding the, in the right the situation can be to good. Actually feed um, elk. But um, there are a lot of things to consider. In this particular case, we, I'm guessing we spent that fifty thousand dollars filling the Bulwacker feed elk. shed, and that'll get us through like a year and a half, From and that's feeding 120 to 180 to elk. So to so, carry that um, out on a on a landscape level like Wyoming does, it's very very be. expensive. I, I don't know in that specific situation. That might day. be something we run they up and look at right now. They eat nine to eleven pounds of feed per day. Um, <laughs> so yeah. um, it's quite the undertaking. It's um, logistically but, difficult. Yeah, uh, elk Again, with in the case of public safety, is never if it's a concern, a then we can um, then we will do it. Um, but it's not something that is very right. sustainable um, on a on a large scale. <laughs> Well, holy there's a cow. bunch of different reasons. That is, was um, a wonderful presentation. Disease, Thank you um, very much. Uh, disease, diseases that wildlife can carry that are transmittable to livestock, and then vice versa. Um, oftentimes, Sierra alluded to competition at feed lines. Um, we've had mult, and this is terrible. But we've had multiple instances of bull elk killing livestock, um, goring. Um, so, for those reasons, when we have those situations, and this, now this is a little bit different. When they get in cattle feed lines, we get really nervous. Um, horses is a little bit different, but it's certainly something we need to take a look at. But they certainly have not reached out to us for assistance. So, but those are the two of the big reasons. Thanks, Mike. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the question was, is if there's plans, especially in a winter like this winter, to set up feeding sites throughout the valley at strategic spots. Um, she mentioned Deer Creek. Um, so we, we try our very best to not feed whenever we can. But in the case of public safety, if there's, if there's a concern of them on roadways and getting hit, we have done feeding in the past um, to keep them away from the road. Um, especially like if you guys were here in the 2017 winter, uh, a lot of animals were just standing on the road because it was the place there was no snow. So we did feed that winter um, across the valley um, and a lot of that was to keep them off of roads and out of, out of developments. We do feed, for that very reason, we do have our only state sanctioned feed site is here in the valley, um, Bullwhacker up Warm Springs. Um, the, that started and has continued as a way to keep elk out of Upper Ketchum, um, partly for public safety. And so we've, we feed elk there every winter, um, about 120 to 200 elk. It's quite expensive. It does concentrate animals. Um, concentrating animals in town comes with a lot of trade-offs. You know, for public safety, those can be worth it. For just trying to keep animals alive at the end, feeding never, never um, saves enough animals, I guess is the only way I can think of to put it, to, to actually help the population. Um, a lot of times by the time we start feeding animals, it's too late. Um, if we start feeding, even now it's starting to get a little late, but if we start feeding in like February, um, a lot of times your, your fawns and your calves that are already doing poorly aren't gonna make it even if you do feed. And the adults are pretty resistant to winter. I mean, cow elk, we have like 98% survival of cow elk. Um, they do very well through the winter. And so we're, feeding is never a solution to like rescuing a population. Um, you might potentially help a couple of individuals, but it's not gonna help your, your bigger group of deer or elk. Um, Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that the um, the the feeding is just arguably like some of the feeding that's already happened has changed migration routes, and that's like why they're <laughs> wintering here. Um, you know, we had a lot of residential feeding going on over the years, and some of it's in, inadvertent. You know, elk in people's haystacks for for deer or for horses and and cattle and people just aren't keeping them out so they're not meaning to feed them and then we had a bunch of people that were trying to help they were well intentioned but it ended up creating these groups of elk that know the feed is there then their calves know the feed is there and it becomes a generational thing and so we've probably already altered 
some behavior by doing that. Um, so again, feeding in the right situation can be good, um, but there are a lot of things to consider before starting it. We, we spent $50,000 filling the bullwhacker feed shed and that'll get us through like a year and a half and that's feeding 120 to 180 elk. So to carry that out on a, on a landscape level, like Wyoming does, it's very, very expensive and you have to have someone who can feed these elk every other day. They eat nine to 11 pounds of feed per day. So um, it's quite the undertaking, it's logistically difficult. Again, in the case of public safety, if it's a concern, then we, can, then we will do it. Um, but it's not something that is very sustainable um, on, a on a large scale. Well, holy cow, that <laughs> is, was a wonderful presentation. Okay. Thanks, Thank you um, very much. Um, and again, if you would, um, Sierra said she'd be happy to stick around. Um, Mike's here in the back. Uh, if you take just a minute and fill out the survey and stick it in the box there, sure would appreciate it. And maybe come tonight and listen to the art talk on Jane Austen. It starts at 530 right here. So okay. thanks again. Take care. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. I'm sorry, oh, Christine. I'm sorry, I got all flustered. Oh, Kristen. Okay, no, I'm not a problem <laughs> so, at all. No, okay. So I think you're probably going to get some follow up okay. Okay. conversations. So go ahead. Hey, Jennifer. It's not so much fish and game, mm -hmm. BLM. Mm -hmm. Wild horses. Mm -hmm. Wild horses are wild animals. Yeah. They should be up there. Yeah. And there should be more education, information. Yeah. Bilaterally mm -hmm. between your organizations that yeah. are like this. Yes. BLM, what's going on? Mm -hmm. We don't have them down here. Yeah. I'm also. Oh, Secretary, <laughs> George White.